Let's consider some hypotheticals. Let's say you got yourself a master's degree. Let's say they got you a job at a small branch of state government. Let's say you worked there for the better part of your early adult life. You built everything around that job, got an apartment, moved in with your girlfriend, had an orange cat with a single brain cell. Life is good, right? Hypothetically, then along comes this man, says he works in conjunction with the federal government and the private sector. The guy reeks corporate, got a suit with a custom cut, no labels on his clothes, tells us that we're gonna be working closely with a small department that has recently got a boost. Apparently, there's a need for expansion and some people from my branch will be moving on up. Let's say that one of those people is me. Hypothetically, all right, I'm gonna stop that. Sorry, this, it gets to me. You can safely presume that I've changed a couple of details to make myself less recognizable. I gotta get through the filters. I had to move from Milwaukee up to Superior. Sarah and I tried to make it work, but she couldn't leave the city behind. It came down to the choice between me and the rest of her life. It made sense for her to stay. Kinda pissed that she kept the cat though. That thing loved me. I started working at the Duck in September of 1998. At first, I didn't even know what the acronym stood for. It wasn't a matter of secrecy, but they had these stupid sayings plastered along the walls that people followed to a T. For example, water of a DUC's back. This was the standard operating procedure. Don't ask too many questions. Like your questions and worries drift right off, like water off a duck's back. They displayed this proudly in the lunchroom with a picture of a duck peacefully sleeping by a pond. We worked in collaboration with other agencies in Michigan, Iowa, and Minnesota, mostly Minnesota. I helped them develop software to codify reports of invasive ecological species. It would break down verbal reports with a bare bones, text-to-speech system, which in turn is transcribed and separated into categories. Categories were measured, analyzed, and turned into probability reports. Once information had been categorized, the most prominent reports would be sent to the department lead. Seems simple by today's standards, but back then it was cutting edge stuff. It was November 1999, when we finalized the first version of our system, lovingly named Daisy. Hours before the launch party, the department lead took me to his office, closed the blinds, and sat quietly across from me for about two solid minutes. This man, the department lead, was Thomas Rubin, a 67-year-old ex-drill sergeant with a penchant for the dramatic, kept his head as bald as his lies. Having worked there for over a year, I thought I had a foot in the door by then. Turns out, I was still on the outside until that very moment. Thomas poured me a shot, mint schnapps, to a job well done, he said, raising his glass. I accepted the invitation and down the shot. What the hell, right? Do you have recurring nightmares? He asked, seeing something strange at night. Those, those last few hours. Before the sunrise, do the shadows gain a peculiar tint? No, sir. You're not a very haunted man, are you? I am not, sir. I can work with that. He poured me another drink. I can get you working on the real deal, he said. But you're not gonna like it. You're not gonna like it one bit. That sound like a party to you. I took the glass and studied it. Little sugar crystals swirling around, backlit from a lone computer screen. I downed the second shot and Thomas smiled. Imagine a lighthouse, he said. And whenever someone thinks about the lighthouse, it lights up. He with me so far. Yes, sir. And this lighthouse draws in all kinds of things from far and wide. Traders, smugglers, warships, everything. But you don't want that. The beach is closed and these ships are bad news. What do you do? We turn off the lighthouse, sir. But it comes right back on whenever someone thinks about it, even when you do it. We demolish the lighthouse, sir. Same thing, pops right back once you think about it. Try again. We forget about it, sir. You can't unknow something. Then you'd have to go after the people that know about it. And you'd have to be careful not to learn anything about it yourself. And that's what we do, said Thomas. We turn off the lighthouses. Thomas elaborated over the course of three more shots. What he was describing was an invasive ecological agent, something that literally grew from the ground. Its very presence acts as a sort of go-ahead for other, more dangerous entities. But thinking about it too much causes it to appear, not immediately, but slowly, over time. The more you knew, 
and the more intimate your knowledge about it was, the stronger the connection would be. I was saved though. You had to know the details to trigger it. Thomas gave me the example of a red lily. You couldn't just know it was red or a lily. You had to know both these things to imagine it clearly. Once you did, there's a chance it starts appearing more and more in your everyday life until it takes physical form. And by then, you've opened an express highway to something far darker and far worse. The duck, or the department for unknown crises, was founded to combat these entities in a way that doesn't endanger the general populace. We were preventative, mostly. The software we made scrubbed away all details and simply stated an address. Sometimes a person and the likelihood of there being at least one physical manifestation of the invasive species present. As the system was automated, there was no way for us to know the details. Only the computer knew. According to Thomas, there was a time when these things had been completely eradicated. Right before the start of the Second World War, there had been a concentrated effort to remove them. The methods they used was later adapted in creation of the duck. Turns out, those things can't ever be truly removed. There was an author who documented these ecological entities to such a degree that it could be used as a gateway. While he passed away in 1926, his diaries were discovered in the 60s. Since then, the invasive species had free reign with no one to stop them. There had been some loose efforts, mostly from the private sector, but it took the creation of the duck to start the work on a larger scale. And there we were. From that point forward, I started to work with more specific field equipment, since being able to imagine the object is something that triggers it to manifest. We needed a way for field agents to physically remove them without putting themselves in danger. We came up with something we called the Blur Guard, a full headset that removes all color, dampens sound, and mildly blurs your vision. Going back to the example of a red lily, the Blur Guard turned it from a red lily to some kind of flower. That's not enough detail to trigger a manifestation and thus deemed safe. Since our software knew what to look for, we incorporated a camera and basic image recognition. There'd be a little green light showing up whenever what we were looking for was in view. From that point on, our field agents could play hot or cold until they found what they were supposed to remove. And when it came to people, well, we can't kill them or have them unlearn something. So instead, there was a targeted effort to herd them into place where we knew this problem was prominent, enough to go unnoticed. The duck had done it for decades. These were personalized, targeted efforts maybe sending a particularly juicy job offer, enticing a target to move, things like that. We focused on two main sites, a rural town in Minnesota and one in West Virginia. There were talks of one up in New England, but that was a separate department. These places have been absolutely scrubbed. To this day, you can't even find them on a map. Our colleagues in the private sector bought out pretty much everything there is to own, giving the duck close to full control. It might seem cruel, but most of these people had no idea that they'd been manipulated. They lived good lives. We did our best to turn off as many lighthouses as we could, but in a town like that, some were bound to pop up eventually. Let's skip ahead a couple of years. In the summer of 2004, I had been on rotation assisting with the development of new equipment. I was also regularly updating both Daisy and the Blur Guard. We had implemented generalized search filters, looking for the trigger words that Daisy could use, increasing our information input tenfold. Hell, about 90% of forum infrastructure could be breached to censor descriptions of the invasive agents, if needed. We had basic bots prowling most major discussion forums to contain eventual spread. One night, I'd taken my work home with me to work on a camera light. Some field agents had mentioned image recognition issues in low light areas where the camera refused to work, so I figured an extra light source would go a long way. I was blasting my work time playlist on my laptop, sipping on my second rum and coke. If I was gonna do extra work from home, I might as well make an event out of it. Just short of midnight, it was time to try it out. I turned off the lights, put on the helmet, and checked to see if the camera light auto-activated as instructed. It did. Strange thing though, I was getting a green marker. The helmet was recognizing the invasive element right in front of me. I know my own apartment top to bottom, so I know exactly what I was looking at. Blurred helmet or no, I'm obviously not going to describe it to you, but it had the appearance of a household plant. Quite large. I'd had it in my window for years. 
for the sake of storytelling. Let's call it a red lily, like in Thomas's example. Suddenly, it dawned on me. Now I knew what the invasive agent was. I couldn't unlearn it. From that point forward, I was going to be a threat to the department. This was an invitation for red lilies to pop up out of nowhere, possibly making everyone aware of them. But first and foremost, they'd be a lighthouse for other things to come. I pulled the lily out of the pot, roots, and all, and shoved it down the garbage disposal. I swear, the damn thing screamed. The empty pot was left on the windowsill. Moments later, my phone rang. Turns out my blur guard was actively connected to the DAISY system. It had probably sent out a report to the department lead with my name and address the moment it recognized the species. I held my breath, trying to calm down. This was going to spark a series of events. There'd be a report, an investigation. I'd most likely lose my job and be forced to relocate. No, worse, this was unprecedented. As expected, the call came from Thomas. What's going on? He asked. I'm working on the, uh, internal camera light. I think there's a malfunction. We got a positive match on your location. I know, I know. It's not a big deal. It's nothing. We're gonna stick to protocol on this one, said Thomas. Expect three field agents on site within 15 minutes. Don't go anywhere. I pulled my hair. My hand wouldn't stop shaking. I usually get the shakes when I'm losing control. I figured I'd better remove all traces of the plant. Whatever parts were stuck in the garbage disposal and whatever remained in the pot. Except when I looked back up, there was another red lily growing from the pot. Almost exactly the same, like it had never left. I can't stress this enough. You can't unlearn things. You can't unremember something. I tried not to think about it, but that just made me think of it more. I fetched a Rubik's Cube from my desk to focus on something else. But as soon as that color showed up, my mind sank back to thinking of it. I got a garbage bag and threw the whole pot in along with the rest of the garbage. There'd be nothing left. I went room by room, looking for anything remotely resembling it, but there was nothing. So I left the apartment, intent on throwing it all away. Let's see, there's this communal garden project outside my apartment building. It was filled with these things. There were dozens of red lilies. My mind blanked, and I could feel my pulse rising in my throat. This entire neighborhood could be compromised. Possibly more. I couldn't for the life of me remember if the lilies had been there earlier that day, or if it was a reaction to my realization. These things were insidious. They not only appear when you think about them, but they make a conscious effort to pop up when they are least expected or wanted. I called my landlord, Jerry, and started pulling up lilies from the community garden with my free hand. Some of them screamed. It was like a tiny wail from a baby. Some of the lilies clung to the dirt, digging their roots deeper. Others came willingly. One of them withered in my hand giving up completely. When Jerry finally picked up, I was out of breath. I need to ask about the communal garden project, I said. I work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. There's a bit of an invasive species growing here, and I need to establish a time frame as to when they appeared. All right, the red lilies, the community garden lilies, they're actually a dangerous and invasive species. Do you have any idea how long they've been here? Red lilies. Oh, yeah. We've had those for a while. How long? There was a silence on the other end. Maybe he was thinking about it. I didn't have that kind of time. How long? Jerry. Look, I, I don't know. Eight, maybe nine years. I grabbed my hair and pulled. The pain in my scalp forced me to concentrate. A handful of hairs gave way. Thanks, Jerry. If you see these, throw them away. Immediately. I'll do that. And don't tell anyone. We don't want to, want to alarm people. I hung up. I was flailing, breaking protocol left and right. I was a breach waiting to be sealed. I was on my knees in the dirt, pulling up red lilies by the handful. One of my neighbors walked past and I could hear her dog whining at the sight of me. Or maybe it saw something I didn't. There was no telling what this would mean. Most breaches we'd encountered was one or two of these things, at most. They were usually contained to the Minnesota side of the operation them having skipped the state line and latching on to me was alarming. This could prompt a whole new level of response. I knew Thomas had a level black response where termination of lives would be necessary to contain the threat, but we'd never employed it. Not yet, but looking around me and running the numbers, this might be it. This could be the first time they'd have to kill people and I'd be the first in line. 
The field agents would be there at any moment. My hands were red and raw from pulling up lilies and stuffing them into the garbage bag. I was so frantic that I grabbed everything that even remotely resembled them. Anything red, anything lily-shaped. I tore up more than half the community garden in 10 minutes flat. I could hear a car coming. I couldn't take any chances. I looked over the garden again, couldn't see any of them, and sprinted to the garbage cans. The moment I'd thrown it all away, I saw headlights turning the corner. I recognized them. I brushed my hands off the best I could and shoved them in my pockets. A white hatchback with government license plates pulled up, and three people got out. I tried to stay calm. I tried not to think about red lilies. I tried to smile. I could tell that I was looking at Agent Stevens Young and Owens. I'd worked with these people plenty of times to prep them for excursion. Never to this extent though, and never on this side of the states. They all fixed and activated their blur guard helmets. Rough night, asked Stevens. Yeah, yeah, I nodded. Working on an update. The helmet kinda, you know. Sure, sure. We'll just check out the apartment and be on our way. You mind waiting down here? No, that's, that's fine. They turned on their image wreckage, synced their calms, and gave me a pat on the shoulder. We'll be in and out, said Young. Sorry about the trouble. I watched them ascend the stairway. While I stayed out by the garden, I was gonna make sure nothing popped up. If the agents just stopped and left, I could come up with a plan. I'd tell Thomas, eventually, but I had to be clever about it. I had to assess the damage and spread to make sure I could trigger a quarantine rather than an eradication level response. Still, looking around the apartment complex, there were probably hundreds of people living there. These things could have made their way into every single household, opening the way for pretty much anything. Not that I had the slightest idea of what that might be. I was lost in thought for the better part of half an hour. What the hell was taking them so long? Had they found one? I walked up the stairway and put my hand on the apartment door. It was quiet. It shouldn't be quiet. I got this sinking feeling, like my body heat was leaking out of my feet. My mind started to race with possibilities. Maybe they left, went to the wrong apartment. Maybe they're watching TV on my couch, having a beer, burning a red lily in the tub. Whatever they did, they wouldn't do it quietly, and this was quiet. I pushed the door open and was met with a chemical smell, like a moist mix of methanol and iron. It was strong enough to taste. Stevens, I coughed out. You guys okay in there? No response. I stepped back out, gasping for fresh air. The smell burned my nose hairs. My eyes started to water as I tried not to sneeze. I didn't want to go back in. I knew it was bad. I could feel it in the pit of my stomach. Still, I didn't have a choice. I stepped back in and shut the door behind me. I turned on the lights. They'd been torn to pieces. There was blood dripping from the ceiling. Two severed arms on the kitchen table. An armless, legless torso resting on the couch. The blood sinking into the cracks in the leather. The floor was covered in gore, torn straight from their bodies and left in the open. Muscle, sinew, vital organs, all splayed out on the floor and furniture. There was a single red lily in a brand new pot, resting on the windowsill. There was a bright red handprint on the bathroom door. I gently pushed the door open, only to reveal the severed heads of Stevens, Young, and Owens, unceremoniously thrown into a pile on the floor of my shower cabinet. I don't know how long I stood there. My mind went completely blank. I could honestly not tell if it was real or a nightmare. For a moment, I was awash with this intense relief. It had to be a nightmare. It didn't make sense for something so terrible to happen so suddenly. It took me a while to realize that there was something looking at me from the bathroom mirror. I turned to it. My face wasn't there, just a dark space where my face ought to be. It was like staring into a hole, vaguely shaped like a humanoid. It followed my movements. As I leaned my head left, and right, we looked at one another in silence, hearing only the blood dripping from the living room ceiling. A trembling whisper burrowed into my spine. Hello, this was one of the things Thomas had warned us about. This was one of the ships that came to shore, following the lighthouse. One of the countless entities invited into my world, drawn in by this thing, that thing that ought not to be. I hate calling it a red lily. I want to scream what it is and have them torn apart but I can't describe them, or they'll spread out of control. The longer I stared at the thing in the mirror, the more I understood. It was one thing to know about the red lilies. It was a hundred times more potent to know exactly how they worked. 
for an average person to know their appearance might invite a few to pop up, but to know them at the level that I did, that was an entirely different league. To these things, I was precious cargo. I could light a hundred lighthouses. A thousand, they perceived Stevens, and the other agents as a threat, and disposed of them immediately. I was the equivalent of a carrier, patient zero. I was stuck in the eye of the storm, and everything around me would be torn to shreds. I ran a hundred scenarios in my mind. Destroying myself was the obvious choice, but that would be the nail in the coffin. That would force Thomas to take violent action on this entire apartment complex. Without context, he wouldn't know how to contain it. Losing personnel was the final criteria for a black level response. However, if it was attributed to a breach of protocol or faulty equipment, I could bring it down to a quarantine. There was hope, but I had to explain it. I had to stay alive. As I pondered my options, I heard a running motor outside. I stepped out of the bathroom and out onto the walkway. Another two white hatchbacks had pulled up. I'd lost track of time. No one in Stevens' team had reported an all clear or anything. This had prompted a standard backup response. If these teams found traces of anything, our entire field division would be called in. They'd probably put people all the way down in Des Moines on high alert within the next 15 minutes. If there was no de-escalation, there were already new red lilies growing in the community garden. They wouldn't let me talk. Talking was a hazard, since I could verbally describe what they were looking for. I could yell out they looked like red lilies, and the entire squad would be compromised. Up until this point, we'd never had to worry about that kind of willful exposure, and there was no plan for it. The duck didn't have enemies in the active sense. We were preventative. There was no way they'd let me talk or leave. Not with three human remains in my apartment. At best, they'd gag me and burn this place to the ground. At worst, they'd shoot me and then do the same. I scurried along the walkway, turning left at the far end. I took the fire escape to the ground floor, hugged the wall of the building, and circled back to the parking lot. I burst into a sprint from my sedan. Luckily, no one noticed. At least no one that cared. As soon as I got on the highway, I called Thomas. I had trouble staying in my lane. My hands kept cramping up. Thomas picked up. I could hear him opening a door, putting on a jacket. You gotta tell me what's going on, he said. Where are you? I had to go. I had to. The place is infested. So let's deal with it. I didn't know what to say. There was no good place to start. I leaned back in my seat, tried to keep the car straight, and took a deep breath. There were flashes of red by the roadside. Could have been red lilies. The back seat was dark. Dark enough to hide a possible shape. I thought I saw an outline in the rear view mirror, but it might have been my mind playing tricks. Stay where you are. I'll have someone pick you up, and we'll deal with it. I can't, I said. It's bad, Thomas. It's real bad. How bad are we talking? Lear, we're talking, uh, quarantine, breach of protocol, at least three casualties. Thomas took a deep breath. He held the line for a few seconds. I could hear him get into a car. You know, don't you? Yeah, that's... I'm sorry, they're everywhere. I can't stop seeing them. Don't tell me anything, nothing. I shouldn't be talking to you. He was right, talking to someone like me. Who knew it was like trying to pet a rattlesnake. It could all be over in a snap. We gotta bring you in. What are you gonna do? Did we lose people? Stevens' team, I said. Something came through. Jesus Christ, are you saying you're causing manifestations? I don't know, but you do know. You, if anyone, knows. So tell me, looking back in the rear view mirror, I knew there was something riding along, something that had caught on to me, something that had stepped into our world. Following the light of the red lilies, there was no point in denying it. I'll figure it out, I said. I'll deal with it. Before Thomas got the chance to object, I turned off my phone and chucked it out the window. I drove for the better part of an hour before a familiar sound snapped me to attention. Whatever surface level plans I'd made in my head dissolved completely. I heard the sound before I saw the flashing lights. A siren. I was probably swerving left and right, trying to keep the car straight. No wonder I was being pulled over. This could get real bad, real fast. I thought about booking it and hoping for the best, but that'd just draw more attention to me. Instead, I found a secluded spot and pulled over. It was only as I pulled the handbrake that I remembered I'd been drinking earlier. That night, I'd had about two rum and cokes. I'd completely forgotten about it. 
I tried to consider my options, but there was no time. I was told to turn off the engine, roll down the window, and place my hands on the dashboard. There were two officers, a man and a woman. I could barely hear them over my pounding heart. To them it was a routine stop, but I was trying to save lives. They had no idea what kind of trouble they were in. I tried to wrap my head around it to come up with something plausible that they'd understand. I could tell them I had a bomb strapped to me or anything, but there was no time. I hadn't even heard them asking for my license and registration. I could feel a flashlight shine on my face, but I barely registered it. They asked me three times, then they changed tactics. Sir, we need you to step out and place your hands on the hood of the vehicle. I fumbled my response. There's something in the car, I said. Phew, you gotta be careful. There's, sir, is there currently a weapon on your person? Something that can puncture or wound my partner? A pencil, a knife, a sharp set of keys. Now, listen, you, you gotta step back. There's something in. My thoughts blanked. There, by the side of the road, I saw one, a red lily, clear as day, growing through the cracks in the pavement. Sir, I need you to cooperate with me, the officer insisted. Have you been drinking tonight? I couldn't take my eyes off the red lily. It was like a reminder that this was already over, that my fate and theirs was sealed the moment we met. Dead men walking. Please, I whispered, let them go. For a second, I thought that might do it. I was willing to listen, to give in, if that's what it took for these people to live. The red lily knew. I know it knew, but like a lighthouse, it can't help but to shine and to bring ships to shore. And with that, a familiar tremble rose in my stomach. Hello. There was a flicker as one of the light posts went out. I closed my eyes, trying to keep the tears in. The officer to my left started screaming. I heard a gunshot, but muffled as if fired into something at close range. I heard fabric being torn, then flesh, then sinew and arteries. No one ever told me it was possible to discern the sound of marrow separating from breaking bone, but now I can't stop hearing it. Hello, primal animalistic screams, a programmed response in our biology to alert other humans to stay away, to run. Splotches of blood rained down on the concrete and the hood of the car. I could feel something warm spatter across my face and run down my cheeks. The scream stopped. I'd sunk to my knees. I looked like a crying altar boy, praying for it all to stop. When I finally forced my eyes open, the world was red with blood. In the flicker of a dying light post, I saw something vaguely human drop the sundered remains of a torso. It followed my head movements, left to right, mimicking me. I could tell it was proud, like a dog bringing back a stick to its master. Hello. I stumbled to my feet, leaning against the car to steady myself. The concrete was slippery with blood, and I kept stepping on something indiscernible. I tried to look straight ahead, as to not look at the entity too closely. It was just standing there, in the middle of the street, looking at me, waiting for me to say or do something. I looked straight ahead, pretending it wasn't even there. The car took a few turns of the key to start. The steering wheel was slippery with blood, but I managed to steer back on the road. The windshield wipers smeared the gore into a thin red veneer. I had to go away far away, and there was only one place I could imagine. As I mentioned earlier, the duck had certain containment areas. Previously, these were spaces where they simply moved people of interest, but with me there, they'd have to leave it alone. I'd be too dangerous to interact with. They'd have to trust that I wouldn't interfere as long as I kept to myself. And out of the way, I burned my car in a field and walked nine miles. I washed myself off in a river. This was a town designed to keep people comfortable enough not to ask questions, so having a stranger wander and off the streets wouldn't be a problem. And everywhere I looked, there were red lilies. They were in the windows of every house, by the roadside, in every garden. Hell, they were even used as a logo. I'd seen that logo a hundred times. Maybe they had no idea what it meant. I've stayed in that rural Minnesota town ever since. I've seen more horrors than I dare to count, but they seemed to ignore me. They treat this place as a nesting ground or a staging area. Considering how many of them there is, I'm astounded that anyone is still alive. Duck has declared this entire town a hazard. I've tried getting in touch with Thomas again, but all my attempts at communication with the outside world has been censored. If this by some miracle gets through the filters, I urge the duck to get in contact with me. I want to be an asset. I want to help turning off the lighthouses. 
and as for everyone else, the best thing you can do is to stop asking questions. Don't question the armed men with strange helmets. Don't look too closely at the strange plant in the community garden. Don't look for anything abnormal, and if you see something, try to consider it might be artificial. Don't dig too deep into this. If you're not involved, consider yourself lucky and stay out of rural Minnesota. I've lived my entire life in a small town by a mountain. The town is so small I doubt you'll be able to find it. Most of the people my age gain some sort of freedom by learning how to drive early and borrowing the family car. I would get my ass beat if my father knew I touched his car, so unless a friend gave me a ride, I got stuck inside this small town with nothing to do. I spent an entire summer saving up enough money for a bike that handled the trails. Then, most of my time was spent riding around to be anywhere, but at home. While riding down through the mountains, I rode over some junk on the trail I didn't notice. I got tossed over my handlebars, my front wheel bending in the accident. I cursed up a storm knowing I had a few hours walked back home with a sore ankle. I grabbed my bike to start back down the trail. I knew I wouldn't get home before dark. That made me nervous. All small towns came with tall tales, and ours was no different. There have always been rumors of the faceless cat that roamed the woods looking for innocent children out after bedtime. A lot of people over the years claimed to see a large cat that stood on its back legs but was missing its face. They also heard some pretty weird noises out in the woods at night, but it's the woods. Animals made noise all the time. I walked down the path, miserable wondering if my father would be home and how much trouble I might be in if I missed dinner. I saw someone through the trees by the lake and considered asking for some help. Talking to strangers wasn't a big deal. Where I lived, cause hell, everyone knew everyone. I made my way over to the riverbed trying to remember the man's name. He didn't even look up from his task. He wore an old torn straw hat with a faded shirt. His jeans so torn he really should have just bought a new pair. I knew him by sight but had never spoken to him before. Everyone called him Old Man Nathaniel. He lived in a shack all year long. He didn't look that old though, just middle-aged, 50 at most. In the summer he shaved his beard due to the heat, and that made him look younger. I heard he was a bit off his rocker. I almost regretted walking over to him. He finally looked up, his blue eyes looking at my bike, and then at my scuffed up knees. What are you doing? I asked him being too embarrassed to admit I trashed my bike. I expected him to shout or shoo me away. Instead, he waved me to come closer. I got nervous unsure of if I should. I looked around for an escape route in case he turned dangerous. I got closer to look over his shoulder. A lot of people around here panned for gold and dug up other expensive minerals. I never heard how much money they made from it. He had a few screens that went over a green bowl. He kept adding water to the bowl, spinning it then refilling it in a way that confused me. With all the washing, wouldn't he let some gold drift away with the water? I watched him for a while, until he had only a small amount of dirt left on the bottom of the bowl. See the flakes? He asked in a very low and somewhat raspy voice. He didn't speak very often. He didn't have any family, and no one dared go near his cabin. I squinted through the small amount of dirt left trying to see the same thing he did. He pulled out an eyedropper to skillfully suck up the few flakes left in the edges of the bowl. He put them inside a small jar he pulled from his pocket. He then reached over to pick up a spare bowl to offer it to me. Do you want to try for a bit? He offered. I looked between him and my busted up bike. I did want to try finding enough gold to pay for a replacement. The idea was enough encouragement to stay with the local crazy mountain man for a few hours. Oddly enough, Nathaniel acted very quiet and calm. He agreed to give me a ride back into towns so I wouldn't be home after dark. So, I stayed with him as we panned for gold. He turned out to be a very good teacher. With a few words, he got me to understand how to pan, and even went into how to spot some signs of gold along a riverbed. By the time we packed up, I found a very small number of flakes in my vial. I moved the sparkling grains around doubting they even equaled the weight of a few grains of sand. There went the hope of a new bike. It's not much. I admitted and held out the vial for him to take. It adds up quickly. Over a few days, you'll notice that. You keep what you found today. Whenever you have time, come by again. You can use my bowls 
until you can afford to buy your own or get bored and quit. I considered the offer. It wasn't as if I had anything else to do. This might as well be my summer job considering there wasn't anything else in this town. I pocketed my few hours of work. Nathaniel pulled out a bigger container with some smaller nuggets inside with smaller flakes. To me, it didn't look like much at all. This amount is worth around 100 and 40 on a good day, he said letting me get a good look. I nearly tripped over my feet, that much, and he was just carrying it around. I simply could not believe that little gold was worth as much as he said. He made a motion for me to hold out my hand to feel the weight of the gold inside the container. If I had a few good days, I might be able to find this much over the summer. Hell, maybe more. I'll get you home. Am I packing you lunch for tomorrow? He asked, walking towards the trail. I quickly collected my bike and nodded. So, what if I hung around the weirdest guy in town? He taught me a pretty easy job and offered to feed me. God, in a bigger town I would have been a prime target for all sort of untrustworthy characters. That was the first time we met. He made good on his promise of driving me back home. I put my bike in the shed unsure of how I would get to the riverbed without it. I didn't dare tell my father where I spent my day. He wouldn't approve or demand I got back out there and stay out until I brought a good amount of spending cash back with me. The next day I needed to walk back to the trails. Nathaniel met me at the entrance of the pathway, a mountain bike by his side, one a bit worn, but better than my own. You can use this one for now, he said pushing the bike in my direction. My body wanted to run, a man I didn't know offered me a bike. He noticed my expression and understood the reason behind it. I understand how this looks. You can take the bike and never see me again. I am an older guy hanging around a teenager. What are you, 13? He said guessing at my age. 15. I said offended. You need to eat more then. It's up to you to do what you're comfortable with. Without another word, he started down the trail with his bag of tools ready for the day. I debated if I should follow. Despite the age difference, I felt like I could trust him. I wouldn't suggest others go down the same road I did. I followed behind, bike at my side determined to find enough gold to repay him for the gift. That second meeting could have turned out poorly. But for the next three years, the crazy mountain man acted more like a father than my biological one did. We spent every day together in the summer. With his advice, he made me open a bank account that my parents couldn't access. Any gold I found got turned into cash to be placed into a savings account. When I was only 17, I moved out of my parents' place. I wouldn't have been able to get away from that house without the hidden stash of cash I put away for two years. Nathaniel even caved in and let me call him Nathan. I've been over to his cabin a few times. I kept begging him to move into town. It wasn't as if he couldn't afford it. I worried for him over the winter. We got nasty snowstorms, and one of these days he would freeze to death in the cabin. He never budged about moving. I even tried threatening him with our local legends. The only time I've heard him laugh was when I said the faceless cat was going to eat him one day. We started to make it a habit of weighing what we found at his place. I'd gone in a few times to exchange my gold, but we found it easier for Nathan to exchange both of our finds. At the same time, I had my eyes on college and got busy when I turned 18. He was out gold panning more than I was after my birthday of that year. I didn't have any friends besides him. I didn't have a clue how anyone found out we spent time together. It wasn't as if anyone kept track of what the local weirdo did, but someone noticed his main source of income. I'd finished sending out college applications, and to celebrate I went to the lake to hang out with Nathan. I wondered just how many summer days I had left spending time with him. After nearly three years, I barely knew anything about Nathan, but I could tell he was proud I took steps to get my life in order. That day we got back to his cabin one day unaware someone else was waiting for us inside. Nathan noticed before I did but didn't act fast enough. His hand flew to where he kept his shotgun. By the door finding the spot empty, I felt a splitting pain in my head the moment after I walked inside the cabin, then nothing for a few hours. When I woke up, I found myself on the floor with my hands tied behind my back. The entire cabin was torn apart by a pair who didn't find what they were looking for. The orange light outside told me I was either knocked out for a few hours or all night. I lifted my head just enough to see Nathan tied to a chair, his head slumped and dry blood caked in his gray hair. I thought he was dead. My chest hurt at the thought, 
One of the people who attacked us noticed I woke up. A rough hand came down to grab a hold of my hair I needed to cut. Where the hell is the cash? He screamed, his breath an awful burst of smell. How the hell should I know? I growled back, a bit of a wrong answer. He smashed my face into the hardwood floor. I heard my nose crunch which sounded louder than my cry of pain. He let go of my hair to go back to ripping the place apart. I knew the bastard from school. He and his brother were expelled for a few reasons. We think the firecrackers in the toilets were the last straw. Rick and Carl, everyone called them the local screw-ups. There wasn't anything else to call them. Nathan stirred, his head weakly lifting to see me. Liam, are you alright? He asked, his voice barely a whisper. He looked so damn old to me at that moment. I needed to get loose so I could get him some medical attention. The brothers came back, a large knife in hand. They forced my friend's head back to expose his throat. A blade pressed against the soft flesh, slightly digging into the skin. Where is it? Where is the cash? Rick spat, his hand shaking. It was clear these two were going through some sort of withdrawal. Because they didn't have any money to buy their drug of choice, they came here for an easy target. Nathan was a man who did nothing, but pan for gold and lived in a shack in the middle of nowhere. If they killed him, I was the only one left to miss him. I never asked Nathan what he did with the extra money. It wasn't as if he spent much on living costs. In the bank, I'll show you where we keep the gold before we cash it. We have some here you can take, Nathan said sounding oddly calm considering the situation. The brothers looked at each other not trusting Nathan had a bank account. That was news to me too. They carefully untied him, but kept the knife at his back. He went over to a floorboard by his bed. He knew that a few other people might get the idea of going through his cabin while he was gone so he hid his findings fairly well. He finally pulled out the small glass jars he kept his flakes and small nuggets inside. He put the stash in front of him waiting for the brothers to take it and leave. There isn't anything here, the one shouted. He kicked the jars, shattering them and scattering a few hundred dollars worth of dust and nuggets along the floor. When I first started planning, I had the same thought. These two just refused enough cash to buy an overdose. I flinched as Rick reached down to manhandle Nathan back to his feet. I rolled on my back and then sat up trying to get over to them. I needed to do something. A knife pointed dangerously at my friend's throat with a shaking hand. I charged forwards using my shoulder to tackle Rick to the ground. I then turned to headbutt Carl, which again wasn't a good idea. He barely felt the pain and turned on me. In a few seconds, I was back on the ground a mad junkie raining down punches to my face. The attack only lasted a few seconds. Nathan reached down to lift the man off his feet. With strength I didn't know he had, he lifted Carl off the ground to toss him clear across the cabin. His expression never changed, not even when the knife sank deep into his throat. I screamed watching his body fall to the ground. Rick stood stunned by what he had just done. Nathan stayed still where he fell, blood pooling on the wooden floor. I scrambled over to him, tugging at my bonds trying to get my hands free. I knew enough not to remove anything stabbed into someone, but I needed to do something or else my friend was going to die in front of my eyes. The sun set, Ethan said through a mouthful of blood. Tears came to my eyes. This man took care of me when no one else did. I risked ending up the same as Rick and Carl, but avoided that outcome because of a kind older man. I never knew what hatred felt like until that moment. I wanted to tear Rick apart. I'd use my teeth if I had to. A hand landed on my shoulder making me look back at Nathan. For some reason, he smiled. A rare expression for him. A cat comes out to play at night. He sat up as he spoke. His voice sounded stronger. He'd never sounded so young before. I wasn't able to stop him from yanking the knife out of his neck. Blood sprayed outwards. And yet, Nathan didn't seem to mind in the slightest. He stood up. Rick and Carl were shocked by the change. I wasn't able to ask what was going on. The front door burst inwards, narrowly missing me before crashing against the other side of the cabin. A sleek black shape rushed inside. The thing was so long it needed to curl part of its body to fit inside. Carl darted away, backing up into a corner whimpering in fear. The face of the monster was directed towards him. Or the lack of a face, the thing had a body like a cat, but just much longer. The face completely flat with a pair of ears on top of its head. In a flash of movement, it crawled along the ceiling until I was directly above Carl. Then the entire thing came down. 
The body twisted around him in a fury. Blood and gore sprouted from between the vortex of fur. His brother attempted to run. He only got two steps. The monster changed into a different shape. It was much like how the locals described it. A massive cat that walked on two legs without a face instead of the long creature it looked like seconds before. A set of powerful claws came down on his shoulders, squishing them into a crushing vice. The void of a face came down over the top of Rick's entire head. His skull disappeared into the darkness. When the flat face pulled away, a stump of a neck remained. My mouth dropped open at the sight. When the faceless cat turned, its head towards me I thought my heart stopped. I've never been so scared in my entire life. A thousand ideas of how this thing was going to kill me next came to mind. I did the only thing I could. I fainted right away. I woke up again, my face throbbing with pain. I felt dizzy, but forced myself to sit up. Nathan sat beside the bed, a broken lamp on giving enough light to see inside the cabin. I looked around trying to find any signs of the attack. The cabin was still torn apart, but I didn't see any blood. What? I croaked out unsure. If I was safe, I really hoped you didn't find out about him. Nathan admitted, his tone even. I didn't get a chance to ask what he meant. A shadow came from under the bed. I screamed, moving away from the creature. It looked smaller than before, but it was still the thing that killed the brothers. A monster circled on the blankets a few times, then started to knead the blankets the way cats did. What is that thing? I choked out. Nathan looked between us, unsure of how to explain what made itself comfortable on his bed. The creature noticed the attention and shifted yet again. This time it looked fairly human aside from the pitch dark skin, no face, and claws. To my horror, it brought the flat face near Nathan's. I thought it was going to eat him the same way it did Rick. Instead, it just tried to nudge the flat face against my friends. He brought a hand up to block the contact as if this was all normal. He's always lived here. I'm not sure if humans have ever come across something like him before. He can change shapes, but like the person won or the cat won the most. Nathan started. I nodded unable to do much else. I could buy a monster living deep in the woods avoiding human eyes, but why was the same monster acting so friendly with Nathan? He knew what question was coming no matter how much he wanted to ignore it. He got lonely after so many years, as well as myself. They weren't picky about our partners. As long as he's alive, I can't die, but he can only come out at night, he explained. Nathan looked better, the knife wound long since healed. He also appeared younger because of whatever connection he had with the monster. I realized then I never spent any time with him after the sunset. Until then, I took a deep breath, ignoring the pain in my face long enough to ask a very important question. Nathan, are you sleeping with the monster that just ate two people? I asked deadpan, trying to keep my voice steady. I thought I already made that clear. He said matching my tone. I needed a minute, nearly dying. That night wasn't the most distressing thing I went through. Nathan let me pace for a while, to let the idea sink in. I've put aside money for you to go to school. Nathan said making me nearly trip over my feet. You what? I sputtered. That answered what he did with his cash. Did he just keep it in the bank until he found someone like me to help? He lived a simple life, and apparently couldn't die. Wouldn't he have better things to spend it on? I still was shocked by the idea of it. We were friends, but I never would have assumed he thought so much of me. You're being wasted in this town. We'll talk about that later. Sit down so I can get a look at your face. I silently listened to him. I was nervous sitting next to the monster, but he minded his own business. Nathan spent some time cleaning the blood off my face and told me we needed to go to the hospital to get my nose looked at. He's always been good at dealing with my minor scrapes. I didn't stand up just yet. I suddenly felt like I didn't want to move. If I left for school, I would be leaving the only person who cared about me behind. How about I stay here? I mean, Nathan's answer was a swift smack upside my head. I made an offended noise, but it did knock some sense into me. I knew leaving this crappy small town was for the best. We left for the hospital and he reported to the local small police force. He said Rick and Carl raided his place, beat us up, and left into the woods. They made a small effort to find them. When their bodies never showed up, no one appeared to care. I did end up leaving that town. I swore to pay Nathan back for him funding my schooling. He just said I should pay it forward to the next person. I do go back home to see him when I'm able. It's nice to talk with a friend. I haven't come across the faceless creature again. I'm glad about that. 
Ethan is a kind person, but I don't approve of his choice of a partner. I fully believe that Monster kidnapped naughty children like how the rumors suggested, along with some hikers and campers. I've looked into reports, and the area has an increased number of missing people compared to other towns. I don't know how to feel about that. He saved me from a dead-end life and yet support something that lurks in the dark. We've never talked about it. I felt far too frightened of the creature to ever bring it up. I don't know how many other creatures are out there. I've honestly gotten my fill of the outdoors. For now, I'm aiming for a city job. I think we humans should stay out of the forest at night. There aren't just animals out there. I don't think a lot of people are going to be lucky enough to get on the good side of the ones who live in the dark. I'm a mom of two. Blair is six and Rosie is three. After Rosie had her third birthday, I decided it was finally time to go back to work after taking time off to raise the kids. Time had gone very quickly, although I was finding it hard to get back into the swing of it at work. So, my husband and I agreed to do two opposite days a week in the office, two days at home, and then both in the office on a Friday while Rosie was to attend a local daycare. Everything was going smoothly. We had a good routine. Until one Friday afternoon, my husband Jim and I were working. Blair was at school, and Rosie seemed to be enjoying her Friday daycare session. Then I received a phone call. But first, let me go back a little. We moved to this new neighborhood around 10 months ago. It was big, but quiet. And the houses were a decent space apart with lots of yard space. This was very different from what we were living in before, but I really loved it there. Our house had two floors and a basement. The attic space was technically another floor, but we decided to just use it for storage. A few months after we moved in, we started noticing a few problems with the house. There were strange smells, which would seem to disappear by themselves. Things would go missing, then turn up in weird places and food being taken from the fridge. I know what you're thinking, we have kids, these things happen with kids, but no, even having kids, these things were strange. My toothbrush, ceramic plates, and even the cleaning supplies which were safely locked away would disappear almost daily, then return back to another room a few days later. One time I awoke in the middle of the night to what I thought was my husband getting up to use the toilet, although, when my eyes adjusted I saw him still laying next to me. This was strange as I was sure someone was in the bathroom with the tap running, but after checking, no one was there, and the light and tap were now off. I asked him about this in the morning, but he confirmed he hadn't gotten up at the time I suggested, so I just brushed it off. Strange things like this would happen frequently. Despite this, as I said, life was going smoothly until this Friday afternoon, when our lives started to turn upside down. Daycare was calling. I was at work in a meeting, but of course, my kids are more important so I answered the call, and here's how it went. Hello, good afternoon, is this Sara, Rosie's mother? Hi, yes, this is she. Is everything alright? Yes, yes, no need to worry, Zara. Just a quick call to let you know that when you come to collect Rosie today, there will be an incident report to fill out. Oh, I, alright, what's happened? Is she okay, is everyone else? Sorry to scare you. Rosie is absolutely fine. Everything is okay. There was just something Rosie blurted out today. It's just nothing sinister or anything, just something she must have heard elsewhere. I won't repeat anything over the phone, but we'll let you know when you come to collect her. We just had to complete an incident report as it upset some of the older children. I could hear the panic in her voice, but my Rosie, this wasn't like her at all. She was so quiet. I picked Rosie up that day a little earlier than normal and the daycare staff informed me she had mentioned something about a man living in her wardrobe who took her toys. I was gobsmacked. Where did this come from? I tried asking Rosie to explain to me what she was talking about, but she'd already forgotten. That evening, I informed my husband Jim about what Rosie had said. He was equally confused, but seemed more scared. You'd think this might have come from an experience. He questioned. I hadn't thought about this before. God, maybe we fell victim to a burglary. I felt sick to my stomach. I initially thought this idea of a man in her wardrobe was something Blair had said or something she'd seen on TV. But was there a possibility of this coming from an experience? Days turned into weeks 
and with intense locking of doors, checking the house, and trying to talk to Rosie about this, we began to move on. Three-year-olds forget things quickly and can say strange things at times, is what we had convinced ourselves. Until one evening around winter break, Jim and I were sitting in the living room watching a movie. It was around 10.30 p.m., and the kids were both upstairs tucked into bed. It had been a long day so Jim, and I cuddled up and both began to drift off to sleep. Suddenly, I was knocked back into reality when footsteps were heard above us. Did you hear that? I whispered to Jim, maybe. He mumbled back, must be Blair getting up for a pee. I waited. No, I thought to myself, it isn't Blair's room above us, it's our bedroom. I'm just going to check. I climbed the stairs, tiptoeing to not disturb anyone. But nothing. The kids were in bed, my room was untouched, and there was nothing unordinary. I chalked it up to being sleep deprived and decided to call it a night. The following day was a Sunday. And since Christmas was only a few weeks away, we agreed it was a perfect day to set up the Christmas tree. Jim and I headed up the narrow staircase to the attic and instantly were faced with an awful smell that smelled like sewage and was sorta of musty. I worried a pipe may have burst and that was what I heard last night, but after investigation, it was all fine. We dusted off the Christmas tree and brought it down the stairs one person at each end. I was on the upper end and while I descended down the stairs, I noticed something in the corner of the attic. Hold on a moment, darling, I said dropping my end of the box. Ah, okay, Jim struggled and lowered his end. I approached the area, which was in an alcove of the attic with a ceiling height of about four feet. I hunched down, there were blankets, clothes, food wrappers, etc. Holy, I covered my mouth. What's wrong? Jim had managed to prop the tree up against the stairs and was now behind me. Look, I exclaimed. Feeling lost for words, my eyes began to water. Previous owners, I questioned. We looked at each other, agreeing. Something did feel off, but it was winter break. Family time was calling, so we cleaned it up and moved on to that instead. If only I had known. After completing the task of bringing the tree down the stairs, Jim, and I went to collect the kids from their rooms to bring them down to help with the tree. Jim went for Blair and I was to get Rosie. We assembled in the living room, unpacking our Christmas memorabilia, dusting off the last 12 months. Christmas films were playing. We danced to music and ate chocolate. It was the best family night for a while. As the kids started to wind down and began to get sleepy, Jim set off to retrieve pajamas from the girls' bedrooms. Please don't let the man in my wardrobe tonight get me. Rosie looked up at me with her big brown eyes. What? What man? My heart began to pound. This hadn't been mentioned for quite some time. I didn't think we'd hear about this again. I will protect you, sweetheart. I reassured her. That's all I could do in this situation. Blair began to get upset hearing about this man and the wardrobe situation which we had managed to hide from her all this time. So I decided to change the subject to settle her. Jim returned, clutching two pairs of purple matching pajamas. We headed upstairs after a snack and I updated Jim on Rosie mentioning the thing again. Must have been a dream she had. He stated, like he was reassuring himself. After tucking the girls into bed, I got halfway down the stairs. When I heard a door opening upstairs, the girls had their own rooms, both in single beds so they could easily leave whenever they needed something, which they did a lot. I rolled my eyes, knowing this was only the start of the bedtime pandemonium. Blair, Rosie, come on girls, it's bedtime. I called up waiting for the reply of the child who left their room. No reply. I went to Blair's room first, but she was out cold, snoring away. I waited to see if she was faking. While standing in the doorway, something caught my eye. The attic door was left open. This was strange as it's a child-proof door, and I'm sure I had closed it after taking down the decorations. I went over to close it, but as I did there was a slight noise coming from Rosie's bedroom. Laughing, chatting, baby talk. There's the door opener culprit, although as I pushed the door open it suddenly stopped. Rosie, I'm coming in, but it was empty. Confused, I stepped inside, checking under the bed, behind the curtains, but no sign of her. I went over to check the wardrobe. Come on, come out Rosie, are you in there? I called out, getting annoyed now. Yes, I'm in here, mama. That wasn't Rosie. My blood ran cold as my expectation of hearing my daughter's voice was replaced by something unexpected. A man's voice, slightly high pitch. 
unsure what to do, I shouted for Jim. Hey babe, can you come here? Please. I felt my words begin to get muffled by tears. Rosie just came down here, Zara. She said she walked past you while you were in Blair's room. What's going on? He replied, I'm just coming up. Speechless, relief flooded over me, knowing Rosie was safe. Relief was quickly replaced by a rush of adrenaline. When I swung the wardrobe door open to reveal a dirty old man standing amongst my daughter's sparkly pink dresses, I screamed bloody murder. Before I knew it, Jim was grabbing my arm from behind and pulling me out of the room. Thankfully, he did this in time as the man was lunging at me, holding one of our kitchen knives. The knife caught my forearm, leaving a gash, but I didn't feel the pain. We ran into Blair's room, scooping her out of bed. I heard the man climbing out of the wardrobe, knocking metal hangers out as he did. Jim and I loaded the kids in the car. The safest thing to do was just to leave. We sped off, driving for what felt like hours before returning to meet the police outside our house. An ambulance came to check me out, but all I needed was new stitches. It could have been a lot worse. Cops found the man hunched in our basement laundry room, still clutching the bloody knife he used on me. They dragged him out in handcuffs, allowing me to get a better look. He was wearing my husband's clothes. His hair was matted, and he was as thin as a stick. He looked ill and vacant like he wasn't all there or possibly on something. That day, while Jim and I were moving the Christmas tree, he managed to escape the attic while we were downstairs, not being heard due to the loud music. Rosie had left her bed that night due to being thirsty, and thank goodness she did as I can only imagine what would have happened. Our missing items were found in his possession, and for six months he had been living above us, hiding amongst boxes, eating our food, using our facilities while we were away, stealing our things, and worst of all, watching us sleep. I feel we are lucky in a way as no one was seriously injured. That night, I recovered well, and Jim and I were really shaken up, to say the least. We moved out of that house three months later due to the horrific memories. We are safe now, and have installed a security system and camera in our new house. If only I had listened to Rosie weeks ago. One night my friend Taylor and I were driving around town looking for some place to eat. Living in a big city with literally a thousand places to eat is a lot like having a TV with a thousand channels at times. There's no limit to the possibilities, but sometimes you still can't make up your mind about what sounds good. They were tired of all our usual places and wanted something new, but couldn't figure out what that should be. I was just about to turn around and order a pizza when I saw it. Inside a massive strip mall it was a large restaurant with a sign over the top saying it was the buttered roll buffet. The place looked brand new and the parking lot was packed, which was saying something because the parking lot was big. Shall we give it a try? I asked Taylor. Sounds good to me. They parked in the first spot we could find and went inside. Once we walked through the glass entryway which was lined with paintings, I barely glanced at. We arrived at the hostess's station. The restaurant was massive and the floor was packed with tables while wooden boots lined the walls. As the hostess seated us, I was hit with a thousand different smells at once. A minute we both gave our drink order, we were free to head up to the buffet and grab a plate. The place was filled with activity because the restaurant's patrons were all circling each buffet section and examining the potential items to try. I didn't blame them one bit because the buffet was a sight to see. The salad station was filled with romaine, an iceberg lettuce, spinach, and arugula all sitting on a massive pile of ice. There were also large dishes of Caesar salad and a huge bowl of coleslaw made with vinegar dressing. Alongside that sat shimmering piles of dressing and further down was a huge bowl of ambrosia salad and a colorful spread of melons and berries. At the front was a station filled with appetizers deviled eggs, crab wontons, jalapeno poppers, fried mushrooms, mozzarella sticks, potato skins, and potato, and tortilla chips fresh from the fryer sat beside queso dip, salsa, and guacamole. The next row was filled with meat dishes, spare rib, fried chicken, pulled pork, several types of chicken wings including buffalo, meatloaf, hamburgers, ham, roast beef, pork chops, and chicken fingers. Behind that was a station dedicated to Italian food. 
pizza with varying types of toppings, lasagna, penne, fettuccine alfredo, rigatoni, spaghetti with meatballs, and calzones were perched next to heaping piles of garlic bread and breadsticks that glistened in the intense heat lamps. Seafood was located next to the salad, and one half was filled with hot entrees, and the other was chilled. The chilled section was filled with smoked salmon, shrimp cocktail, tuna salad, and oysters, while the hot section was loaded with crab legs, coconut shrimp, clam chowder, fried clams, fried perch, tuna casserole, and crab cakes. A station dedicated to side dishes was filled with mashed potatoes, fried potatoes in several forms, cheesy potatoes, macaroni, and potato salad, baked beans, macaroni, and cheese pasta salad, and onion rings. But the most impressive spread of all was the desserts. It was massive, a self-serve ice cream machine that offered vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry was beside a spot to make your own strawberry shortcake. Farther down, a chocolate cake with icing that gleamed in the light sat beside baklava, massive slabs of cheesecake, kiramisu, chocolate chip cookies, apple turnovers, fresh baked blueberry, and cinnamon muffins, donuts, peach cobbler, banana pudding, and coffee cake. Taylor and I eventually each loaded up a plate and returned to our table. Either of us said a word as we chowed down. It was all delicious, and in no time at all, we'd finished what we got and went back for a second plate, taking care to get what we'd been unable to try last time simply because we didn't have big enough plates. It didn't take long for us to get full, and before long we asked for the check paid and left a good sized tip and slowly walked out of the buffet. That was the best buffet I've ever been to in my life. No question, Taylor said once we were back in the car. Me too. I nodded as I started the car. It's no wonder that place is packed. We'll have to come back. Absolutely. For all I ate, I still didn't get to try everything I wanted. Me neither. I dropped Taylor off at his condo before I went back to my own place. In the morning, I was still so full I could barely manage a bagel. But by lunchtime, I was slowly starting to feel like I could eat normally again, which was good because that evening I was expected at a dinner party at my cousin Joy's house on the west side of town. I arrived right on schedule at six, and after some appetizers of buffalo chicken dip and stuffed artichokes, the seven of us all gathered around for some roasted chicken, mashed potatoes, baked carrots, and spinach salad. While everyone was having some pineapple upside down cake for dessert and chatting, Howard, my cousin's husband, looked up at everyone. Did everyone hear about that apartment building that caught fire last week? Everyone around the table murmured a yes. The sister-in-law of one of the people who died is my coworker. She said that night she had gone out with her brother-in-law at that new buttered roll buffet place. I just went there for the first time, I said. How was it? Josh, another dinner party guest, asked, Tasty, Joy and I went there the other day for the first time. Howard said, It was delicious. I've heard it's amazing. Josh said, I'll have to try it. You'll enjoy it. Howard added before taking a sip of coffee. The rest of the week passed without anything interesting happening, and time went on until it had been some time since Taylor and I had our first meal at the buffet. It wasn't until the next month we decided to go back. The experience walking in was the same as the first time, with the competing smells of food greeting you. And just like last time, we ate a wide variety of food until we were full. The place was even fuller than last time, with each table full so we sat in the booth. On one trip up to the buffet I noticed the people at the booth next to us. The man had closely cropped black hair, and the woman had thick blonde curls. I politely nodded my head, and said hello when I made eye contact with them, and they did the same. Taylor and I left just as full as last time, and we went our separate ways to go home to relax, but I still felt full as I went to bed. The following morning, I was beginning to feel something resembling an appetite again, so I made my way to the kitchen to make myself some oatmeal for breakfast. I was waiting for the microwave to finish, when I saw on my phone that there had been a nasty car accident last night on a highway about 15 minutes away. The truck had lost control and absolutely totaled an SUV. My jaw dropped when I saw the couple involved were the people we'd sat next to at the buffet last night. Ignoring my oatmeal for the moment, I texted Taylor. That's terrible. He texted back quickly, but that buffet is most definitely last meal worthy. It certainly is. I eventually finished my oatmeal 
and went on with my day. It was another month before I was remotely ready to go back to the buttered roll buffet, but one day after Taylor and I went out hiking with some friends, we were ready. And just like before, the buffet was more than ready for us. Cody and Justin, the two friends we'd gone hiking with, had never been to the place before and they were just in awe of it as we'd been. This time they had a station for waffles and crepes with toppings you could choose from. I went with banana, peanut butter, and chocolate, while Taylor went with strawberries and cream. Then it was off to get some chicken parmesan, baked ziti, and antipasto salad. Meanwhile, Cody and Justin were waiting at the panini station where a smiling chef was customizing sandwiches for patrons. Cody got a ham and cheddar while Justin got a turkey and gouda. We all ate plenty and once our bill was paid, we strolled out at a leisurely pace. Once we got in Taylor's car, he turned on the radio and we sat in a peaceful silence as we drove to Justin's where our cars were all parked. We were almost to his house when there was a Dieter sign blocking off the main road, so we had to take a route that added 15 minutes to the drive. It took us to a part of town that was quiet, with houses spaced far apart from each other. The area had been bought by a bunch of companies for development, but for what I had no idea, Taylor eventually turned right onto a stretch of road near an abandoned warehouse. By now it was pitch dark out and the few street lights the area did have cast a sickly glow onto the pavement. I would not want to be one of the few houses on this street, but when they were halfway down the street, Taylor slammed on the brakes because the road was obstructed by a massive SUV that was parked in the middle of the road with its doors ajar. I looked around, and there was no one in sight, nor was there any sign of an accident. Something about the situation gave me a bad feeling. Something was up, I just didn't know what. What's going on? Taylor asked everyone in the car. I don't know, but I don't like it. Cody muttered. Let's go back the way we came, especially because that's the only way we can go. I added, you can't go around it. Taylor nodded briefly and made a deft turn around. But just as he was about to start back down the way we came, I saw a flash of movement come out of a nearby alley and a bunch of men in dark clothing emerged into the clearing. They weren't close enough to see their faces or make out their features, but the minute they saw us I heard angry yelling, and Taylor floored it out of there. I did my best to ignore the sickening lurch in my stomach as I looked in the passenger side mirror and saw the group of strangers pile into their SUV and immediately start to follow us. My chest felt uncomfortably tight as I clenched my hands into fists and tried to stay calm. From behind me, I saw Cody and Justin had also noticed we were being followed. Taylor also did, but to his credit all he did was take a deep breath and try to focus. No small feat considering the car following us seemed to be gaining on us. If they caught us or we wrecked out here we were in serious trouble. But after a moment I saw Taylor's eyes light up. Cody, can you see that box there on the floor by your feet? He asked. Yeah, what about it? I've been helping my uncle with some maintenance work at his loft. That box is full of nails. I want you or Justin to roll down the window and dump them all in the road behind us. I'll do it. Cody quickly nodded and picked up the box. As I looked in the back seat, I saw that it was stuffed to the top with nails in various sizes. Slowly shake them out so they're spread everywhere on the road. Taylor instructed. Cody nodded and looked a bit pale as he rolled down the window and a chilly breeze filled the air, but he slowly tipped the box in our wake and all the nails began to scatter on the road. In the dim lights they cast a silver gleam as they spread and rolled across the blacktop in every direction. The SUV behind us took notice of that after a moment and tried to swerve to avoid the nails, but since they were everywhere it was impossible. In an instant they drove over some and I saw the vehicle swerve unsteadily and go off the road only to collide with a signpost. We all cheered and patted Taylor on the back while he got us out of there and drove to my house, which was the closest one. On the way, I called the police and told them what happened. They agreed to check out the road and meet us at my place. When I hung up, I was on edge for the rest of the drive, as I was afraid there were more of them out there or they'd find some way to come back and follow us. I sighed with relief. When we finally got to my duplex, where the police were indeed waiting for us, they found the crashed car that had spun out because of the nails. All four people in it had suffered some kind of injury. It turns out all four of them were well known to law enforcement from past incidents. 
but this time they got caught as they had been up to no good in that part of town. When the four of us stumbled upon them, the next bit of information they gave us made my blood run cold. When the authorities searched the area, they discovered the business the four men had been up to when we found them. The four strangers had kidnapped a man, but he'd managed to escape on that stretch of road and he ran far enough away that the four men followed him until they gave up and he stayed hidden until he saw the police sirens. That was why the car had been pulled over so randomly. I don't even want to imagine what they would have done to them had they caught him, or us, had they caught up with Taylor's car. The cops eventually thanked us for our quick thinking and left. The four of us were exhausted, but we knew there was no way we were gonna be able to sleep after that, so we hung around. At some point, a thought in my head clicked and I remembered something. We had almost encountered disaster after eating at that buffet, like several other people around town. I took out my phone, and after some searching, I found there were many other cases of people encountering disaster, or near disaster after eating at that buffet. The incidents ranged from accidents to events like ours. It was uncanny to see. I told the other three what I thought, and they sat there silently. I know what you mean, Craig, and I can't explain it. Taylor eventually said, Sometimes there are just things you can't explain, things that are beyond coincidence. I don't know what to call it, but I don't disagree with you. Remember how you said, that place was last meal worthy? I asked, I do, I can't stop thinking about that either. But one thing I know for sure is that I'm not exactly keen on going to that buffet ever again. I agreed, we eventually went our separate ways, and spent the next few days trying to get some sense of normalcy back. Part of that included avoiding the buffet at all costs. I didn't even want to drive past it, but even I wasn't prepared for a news headline I saw about two weeks later. I just finished my morning coffee when I saw that the buffet had been the victim of a terrible fire late the previous evening. According to the fire department, the fire had taken place when the buffet was closed and no one was there. But then things got weirder because virtually all the damage was limited to the entryway and the buffet's front with the glass entryway and the walls lining it sustaining most of the damage. As if to cap off the weirdness, the fire chief said that there was a pending investigation, but didn't flat out say the fire was intentional, not that he needed to. I sat there with my coffee in one hand, my phone in another. Someone had set fire to the buffet, but focused on the entryway. That was oddly specific. But then I remembered something. Those weird paintings lining the walls as diners walked past on their way in and out. Was that what the fire was supposed to destroy? A quick search turned up an article about the buffet's opening. I skimmed through the usual stuff and went straight to the pictures of the restaurant and stopped when I saw a photo of the entryway. I'd never really taken a good look at it before, but now I was and the paintings were downright creepy looking to me. In the restaurant's regular lighting, they were indecipherable, but in the sharp light from photography, they were unsettling. Some paintings showed vague humanoid shapes crawling on the ground and scratching for what looked like food, while others showed similar looking shapes gathered together with sick grins on their faces. I had no desire to look further. All I know is that my friends, and I will never go back to that buffet again if it ever reopens. There are plenty of other options, and plenty more new places will come. That's what I love most about a big city, but ceaseless change. There's always something new to see, try, or experience. My fiance Grace and I went to my family's cabin at the lake for a long weekend. Built by my grandfather, it had been the site of countless cookouts, birthdays, campfires, and holidays. Just walking in the front door brought countless memories rushing back. I had lived in countless houses over the years, but the cabin had always truly felt like home, probably because it wasn't like numerous people had moved in and out of the area. Over the years, there were over a dozen houses within a five mile area, and as far as I could tell, they'd all been owned by the same families for decades, just like mine had. We may have taken the odd vacation when I was younger, but most of the time we came out here, and that was always just fine with me. It was an average, two-story cabin, but the minute you walked in, you felt instantly comfortable. The numerous windows and the back facing the lake all featured a beautiful view, and there was a cozy screen and porch in front in addition to a glass-enclosed patio that held a table 
and chairs. Past that was a fire ring we had with some outdoor furniture and a walkway that led to the lake itself. It was a sight that never failed to be invigorating. Today was no exception, with the gentle breeze that accompanied the waves of the lake as they continually splashed against the shoreline. We got settled in, then we had some pasta and garlic bread for dinner, and soon after that we built a fire outside that we ate some fresh baked cookies around. It was beyond peaceful, and a perfect evening. But when we got up the following day, there was a report that a storm was heading our way. That wasn't a problem. In fact, watching a storm forming over the lake had always been an amazing sight. You can literally feel it in the air. When the pressure changes, and it's an experience like no other, so Grace and I sat comfortably in the deck chairs, while the storm winds rolled in later that evening as the winds whipped through the air and the temperature immediately dropped about 15 degrees. We watched contently as the waves on the lake splashed against the beach and the break walls surrounding the area. Once the rain started to come down in thick waves, we went inside and sat in the patio and watched the storm hit while we had some coffee. It was an impressive sight. The waves continually slammed against the shore and the rain pounded against the glass in a strong but relaxing rhythm. Eventually, the storm slowly faded and all was calm, but everything was soaking wet. This was around the time we went to bed. The next morning, everything was sunny again. When I went out with my morning coffee to look at the sun looming over the lake, I noticed something lay in the sand near the water's edge. When I went for a closer look, I saw it was either gold or made to look like gold and was shaped like a medallion and had a small gold chain attached to it. I picked it up and immediately noticed it was heavier. Then it looked and it was inscribed with symbols on both sides that I didn't recognize. There had been no shortage of interesting things that had washed up on the beach in all the time I'd spent here. I had no doubt the storm had either stirred something up that had been stuck underwater or it had fallen off some boat because of the intense winds. But there was something different about this, something unique. This wasn't some souvenir from one of the many shops that lined the route from here to the city. So I took it inside, put it on the patio table, and had cereal for breakfast. When Grace came downstairs, she saw me sitting at the patio table and smiled. Then she saw the medallion sitting nearby and glanced at it. What's that? I don't know. It washed up on the beach from the storm, right? She tilted her head slightly. Looks mysterious, like something out of an antiques collection or a museum. I thought the same thing. I'll see what I can find out when we get back to the city. Good idea. After that, we took a hike around the local park and came home for lunch. Then we went to the local movie theater and a nearby restaurant for dinner, a place that served some of the best seafood I've ever had. Then we went to the ice cream place next door. By the time we got home, it was getting dark and fireflies dotted the air along with the other books. As usual, the water and the seagulls could be heard in the background as we unlocked the front door and went inside. The two of us got comfortable on the couch, turned on the TV, and settled in for the evening. At some point about an hour later, I heard a noise. It was small, so small, I wasn't sure I'd heard it at first. But then I heard another one, and my heart rate slowly picked up. Then I heard voices outside by the garage, whispering to each other. That was when fear truly hit me. Voices whispering outside your house at night are never a good sign, especially when you hear voices followed by the sounds of them breaking into your garage. I could hear the garage door open and close before the footsteps slowly crept closer to where we were in the sitting room. Grace and I looked at each other for a moment before we ran as quietly as we get to the dining room because underneath the dining room table was a trapdoor that led to a storm shelter that doubled as a secret passageway. I'd spent a ton of time down here when I was younger, but I never seriously thought I'd ever hide down here for real. But that's usually how it goes. Most people think of hide and seek as just a game to play with your friends. But when you're an adult, the concept can quickly turn into a matter of life or death. I crawled under the table, carefully pulled at the small rug that hid the trapdoor, and tugged it open. I helped Grace climb down into the storm shelter before I joined her. The rug that hid the trapdoor was positioned in a way so that it didn't move when the trapdoor was opened, so it always hid the entrance to the passage. I had just barely closed it all the way and moved further down into the passage 
when I heard the door to the garage open. The quiet creaking was somehow more frightening than if it had been kicked open. Then all was silent for a moment until the smallest sounds of movement followed. Everything seemed eerily quiet. You could hear them moving around upstairs, just a few feet above our heads. I frantically hoped that the hidden storm shelter stayed hidden, and we both tried to keep as quiet as possible. It was all so surreal, sitting there in the dark, while strangers were above us, and looking for whatever they were here for almost felt like a dream. The whole situation seemed like it was unfolding around us, and we were simply there watching whatever was going on. How could this be happening? Why could this be happening? Were they looking for us specifically, or just for whatever valuables they could find? I got a knot in my throat as I thought of the possibility. There could be no reason for this at all. All we could do was hide, and not draw attention to ourselves. The space itself went a long way to give me something resembling hope and peace of mind. The space was deep, well insulated, and carefully hidden. We stood there amongst the storage boxes and cobwebs, trying to be quiet while frantically paying attention to what was going on around us. I listened to every little sound trying to discern anything that may tell us something about what was going on. My heart was pounding so loud I thought I could hear it, but I forced myself to calm down to focus on what was going on. They didn't know we were down here, or where we were, but we knew where they were, and that gave us an advantage. So I listened very carefully, and I noticed several things. The first was that there were three of them, or at least, that there were three intruders inside our house. There could have been more outside, but I suspected there weren't because that would raise the risk that someone would notice them, so three intruders seemed like the best conclusion. But the second thing I noticed was far more frightening. The longer we were down there, the more I realized something even more chilling than the fact that we had intruders in the house. These intruders seemed to know the cabin. They walked around with a familiarity that was shocking. There were no sounds that suggested frantic searching or hasty movements. There was nothing but controlled, steady, calculated footsteps throughout the house as the intruders moved logically from one room to another, looking for whatever it was they were after. I frantically racked my brain to figure out how that was possible, ignoring the fear that was creeping through my body the same way the intruders were creeping through the house. If they heard us coming, they couldn't have gotten far. Their car is still out front, one of the intruders said once they had finished searching the cabin. I knew from listening that there were two of them nearby, and they were standing far too close to the passage entrance for comfort, right? Or they may be at a friend's house or something. Either way, they're not here. My stomach sank when I heard the voice of the second person standing nearby. I knew that voice. It was James, my colleague from work. The sense of fear that I had tried to ignore exploded with the fury in my gut, making me feel sickened and angry. I had told him about the cabin, and he'd seen pictures of the place from my time here over the years, so he knew the general layout. Fortunately, I had never told him about the storm shelter. I was never more grateful that I had never shared the secret passage with anyone. Hey, what's this? I heard the third intruder ask. From what I could tell, both from the sound of his voice and where his footsteps went, he was in the patio. I don't know, James said. Looks like some old necklace looks valuable too. They had found the medallion that had washed up on the beach that morning. Right, the other one said. We should definitely take it. Worth money, no doubt. There was a pause, and I listened, as intently as I'd ever listened in my life. Any sign of where they are? James asked after what felt like an eternity. None. The third intruder answered. They're gone. No sign of them anywhere. All right. Well, we got this necklace. I can tell there's definitely some money to be had here. That's enough for tonight, I guess. Let's go. Three pairs of footprints thudded on the floor above our heads. I listened as they walked through the house and went back through the garage door. Then, a moment later, a car started and pulled away, race, and I sat there in stunned silence. We didn't dare speak for a moment. Then I took a deep breath, pulled my phone out of my pocket, and called the local police and told them what happened. They agreed to come out immediately, and told us to stay put, not that we needed to be told. I didn't remotely want to leave the storm shelter until it was all clear, so Grace, and I waited in stunned silence for what seemed like an eternity. When the cops arrived, we came out of the storm shelter, and they asked us to check the state of the cabin. Everything was just as we'd left it. The cops asked if anything was taken, and I said no, 
and explained that the only thing they took was something that washed up on the lake shore that morning, so it wasn't like we'd suffered a loss. They nodded solemnly and went about doing their job. The upside to getting your house broken into and finding out it's your coworker without them knowing is that if you manage to escape, the police know exactly who to look for and it wasn't hard for me to point them to the people with access to James's address and other contact information. But when the police went to his address, he wasn't there. And from what they said, it seemed like he hadn't been there in several days. So they filed a report and kept an eye out for any leads. It was a hiker who eventually provided the location for James. And it turns out for his two associates. About a week after the break-in at the cabin, the hiker was walking along a trail near a cliff. And when he looked down, he saw the wreckage of a car there. The hiker called for help and it didn't take long for them to discover the car belonged to James, who was found in the driver's seat along with his two associates in the back. Doctors found nothing to suggest James had been intoxicated or anything, so the authorities concluded the most likely cause was that something had caused them to swerve off the road and go over the cliff where they quickly succumbed to their injuries. Once they found James, they were able to piece together his final days and in doing that, found out the full scale of his burglary operation. A storage unit with hundreds of thousands of dollars in stolen goods was found in his name near his house. And over time, all the contents that could be returned to their owners were. And there was one other thing they found in the wrecked car. The medallion that turned up on the beach that morning was found in the glove compartment. And the cops found out that James had been on his way to a meeting with an antiques expert to have it assessed. When the accident happened, the authorities had the medallion assessed as well and what they were told was amazing. Apparently it was worth a lot of money as it was made of real gold, but the markings on it translated to a warning that misfortune could befall whoever possessed it. The authorities offered me the medallion back, claiming it had been technically taken from me, but I declined. Too much had happened and besides, we had been lucky enough as it was. I was more than happy to let them do what they wanted with it. We eventually got an alarm system for the cabin, and things eventually returned to normal. But I can't help but wonder if stolen goods had been the only thing James was involved in. It's just a suspicion, but something about his attitude, and the way he and the others had casually walked around, and wondered how far we had gone makes me think, especially since they didn't take anything else from the cabin. This is how it started. Last autumn, my younger sibling just stopped eating, gradually at first, so that you wouldn't notice unless you were paying attention, which I, three years older, and her brother at that, decidedly was not. Lydia began by only half finishing her meals, avoiding breakfast, then stumbled into the habit of conveniently forgetting her lunch when she set off for school, or else claimed that she'd buy something at the cafeteria, and never did. When our dad finally noticed the habit, he started dropping her off at the school gate so that he could watch her carry her food into the premises, a pointless venture, seeing as she'd dump it in the nearest trash can or give it to another student as soon as she could. I didn't get involved, then, figuring that if Lydia wanted to go on a diet, then it was none of my business, but she was never particularly heavy to begin with. And when the weight loss really got going, I started to wonder how I might bring it up without sending us both into an orbit of embarrassment. Eventually, matters progressed to the point that the other kids at school started nudging each other in the corridor as she sauntered past, Lydia oblivious, buried in her headphones, a hoodie perpetually half pulled down over her face. She was so gaunt by that point that I could probably have closed a hand around her thigh and her cheeks had drawn in like some old folk art piece of a witch you'd see on someone's stoop around Halloween. Things had gotten bad at home. Two, every meal was strung with thunderous tension, ending either in screaming matches between Lydia and my father over an untouched plate or else excruciating silence. Dad and I trying not to watch as my sister pushed the same forkful of potatoes around the edge of her plate. The day I burst into the bathroom to find Lydia spitting food into the toilet bowl was when I finally snapped. You've got to do something, Dad, I said, cornering him in his home office. I was irritated by his mumbled excuses, his bloodshot, avoidant eyes. She's going to end up in the grippy sock ward if you don't get her some help. I understood, grudgingly, the agonizing position that my father was in. 
He'd wrangled every feminine issue from periods to the bra talk entirely alone, vanishing into his study afterwards with the expression of a man ready to put a noose around his neck and kick the chair from under him. There were no female friends or relatives on call for such occasions. My mother had died of an aggressive bone cancer when I was 10, passing only a month after her diagnosis. She was gone so abruptly that it was like watching the epilogue of a documentary, a blink, and you'll miss a captioned statement. Where are they now? Black screen and tape, too fast for any of us to feel our grief in its full gravity or to prepare ourselves for the years of unrelenting misery to come. Somehow Lydia had always held on to her memories of mom better than I had. Remember that time she drove us all the way to work before she realized we were still in the back of the car and they let us stay in the office. Or remember that time she came trick or treating with us and ended up with more candy than we did because that one weird neighbor kept flirting with her, saying she looked like our big sister. All that I had left of our mother were the palest fragments, like how tall she was, or the sound of her guffawing laugh, the tattoo of a wolf on her arm she'd gotten when she was 16, that I used to tell her looked cross-eyed, when really it was so faded that you couldn't make out the face at all. I guess Lydia really needed mom more, and that was why those recollections stuck. That, or I merely found it easier, not to remember the best times of our lives, because I knew that they would never come again. Months passed, and Lydia didn't get any better. Although she and my father had figured out some kind of understanding between them that he wouldn't make her sit at the dinner table anymore, she skipped school a lot, hiding out in her room, or at the houses of a few other kids with problems that she'd fallen in with. I could see Lydia drifting further and further away into the sad and hungry thing that was taking her, and I didn't realize how deeply it was getting to me until one day I went through a collage of old pictures of us together on my phone and burst into tears. We were close when we were kids, inventing all kinds of made-up games with a host of imaginary friends that each had their own names and backstories. Even mom and dad used to play along, sometimes getting into it even more than we did. It's hard to say when that intimacy ended, whether it was the usual brother and sister growing apart phenomenon or something more. Lydia never stopped being the weird kid and I ended up in a middling popular crowd. I'd been relieved that she kept to her own oddball friends, the nerds, the theater kids, and the goths, a universe apart from me. But looking at those old pictures before Lydia got sick, apple cheeked, throwing up peace signs, and rock on gestures in every frame sent me into such realms of mourning that I thought I might never come out of it. I slouched around for weeks at a loss as to what to do with myself. Then, on an otherwise banal Thursday evening, the cops came around wanting to speak to my dad and Lydia and after that my sadness unfolded into something else. I remember hovering in the kitchen doorway, eavesdropping as an officer that looked like an aged out surfing instructor asked questions in hushed tones about a day last October, before Lydia's illness began. My sister sat, staring at the gravel chips of her fleshless knees, glazed-eyed as a lobotomy patient, mumbling infrequent answers as my dad twitched with a panic, neurotic restlessness, his narrow, radish features greasy with sweat. I had no idea about any of this, he kept repeating as the officer looked blandly unconvinced. As it transpired, Lydia wasn't in any trouble, rather, the trouble had happened to her. One afternoon, my sister had taken a shortcut home from school through the same sketchy scrub of forest that some of the kids at school called Trashnaland, rumored to be a popular spot for drug dealers and those interested in outdoor sex. Being that it was still broad daylight, Lydia hadn't anticipated running into either guest, and like most teenagers was of the regrettable thinking that she'd turn up unscathed. No matter her situation, there had been a man there, acting strangely as men hanging out in the woods want to do. Lydia had kept up a brisk walk past him and was almost out of the area when the stranger had put a hand on her shoulder, pulling her back into the trees, into the dark. The details were as frank and as undecorated as that, their baldness as vicious as a slap. Apparently there had been some description given of the man, however, for he had recently been seen again in the area, and the police wanted to know if Lydia could help with the investigation. The worst thing about that living room talk was the absolute chaotic awkwardness of it all. My father, stuttering, and blinking like he'd shot up sometime, 
In the past half hour, our sheepdog, Brittany leaping around everyone's legs, yapping in joyous obliviousness to the severity of the situation, Lydia picking at the skin around her fingernails, staring through the floor, an unyielding mute. If it had gone on another minute, I would have screamed. I felt it in the trembling of my fists at my sides. In the end, I burst out of the kitchen and ushered the officer from the house, glaring back over my shoulder as my father darted into his office with a bleakly comical velocity. The minute the cop was out of the front door, I went to sit by my sister on the couch, watching her tiny jaw tense against the interrogation she'd evidently sensed would come. Who the hell was this creepy guy? I asked, as gently as I could, given that I was trembling with rage. I swear if I find him, I'll knock his teeth down his throat. Lydia glanced up, her vague eyes sharp with a sudden agitation. I'll always remember how quickly they changed. The pupils eating the irises like dying stars. The blue gone to black. Don't, she said, firmly. Just leave it alone. Johnny, all right. She looked frail and feral, almost. Her hands like little fox claws in her lap. Yet in some strange way, I was scared of her. The way I remembered being frightened of my mother in the end. Screaming at the nurses to be allowed to die on her own terms. As the cancer gnawed through her hollow bones. There's a ferocity in people that are that close to death an indignant anger at the degradation of mortal suffering that drives them mad. I knew, looking at my sister then, how serious her illness was, and felt myself engulfed in such desperation, that I sat for a long time in silence, aware of her vast, black, lunatic's eyes upon me. Then I got up and went to confront my father, an advent that had now become a grim routine. You're an ass, I snapped, kicking the wheels of his computer chair, as he sat, wincing, with his back to me. He knew what happened way before that cop turned up, right? And you didn't do anything. He let things get this bad. You don't know what I've been doing, my father protested, holding up his hands in submission. Lydia hasn't got any worse recently. I'm trying everything I can. At that moment, I hated him. This thin mockery of an adult with his blotchy, balding scalp, all blundering anxiety, his flapping inability either to seek justice for my sister or to help her eat. As far as I was concerned, my father had sat idle at his laptop as she had cliff-dived into wounded obsession that perhaps been the reason Lydia had taken that dangerous road home, lacking the parental steering that might have set her on another path. I'll never forgive you for this, I snarled, unmoved by the cringing servility in my father's eyes, and I bet Lydia won't either. You're a bad dad. I marched out of the room, slamming the door so hard against the wall that it dented the plaster. That night I had the worst night's sleep I'd known since I was 10 years old, wanting my dead mother in the night. I dreamed of her, mainly drifting snapshots of her smiling in a white bed that became flowers, that became her, kissing me until my face came away like ash in her mouth. Sometimes I dreamt of Lydia, a little girl lost in fathomless trees, beckoned down to their roots by a figure I couldn't quite see. From time to time, I jolt half awake as though I tripped over an unseen step before plummeting back into another weird slumber, repeating the pattern so many times that I can't be sure if I ever really woke up at all. Another dream, again of my mother, tall as a drifting balloon and just as weightless, tearing off the head of a beaming orderly with her teeth in silent slow motion. This image unsettled me in particular, something about the beatific nature of the killing, the detail of my mother's face clearer then to me than it had ever been in memory. That time, when I awoke, I didn't go back to sleep, getting out of bed with such haste that the blankets wound about my ankle, and almost tripped me. Half laughing at my dozy absence of coordination, I decided to make a trip to the bathroom, if only to splash my face, and have a rousing word with myself in the mirror. It was as I stepped out across the landing that I saw the door to Lydia's room was open, the space within, though dark, clearly empty. Most likely she'd either gotten up to make herself secretly sick, or else snuck out to see one of her weird new friends. Both had happened before, and I regretted not having tried to intervene. Running a hand through my tousled hair, I turned back to my room, intending to get dressed, and head out in search of her. Then I heard it, a low, throaty groan, a sound either sensual in nature, or of pain, or both at once. Even then, I'd heard of such things, even stumbled upon them in my boyish ventures on the internet. It was coming from the direction of my father's bedroom, and as a muttered, indistinct word followed I understood that he was not alone. 
I stopped in the hallway, my gut a pit of sour consternation. Dad hadn't found another partner after my mother was too chronically shy to attempt the dating world all over again. If there was another person in his room with him then it could only be my sister and I knew that I could not in good faith leave her alone if one of them was unwell. The other possibility of what she might be doing there nudged at me as I stepped towards the door, breathing its sickly warmth against the back of my neck. I did not let it in, my mind a careful blank as I wrapped my fist around the knob and peered into the room. Two figures lay together in the semi-dark, colored only by the nauseous tungsten light of my father's bedside lamp. My dad lay across the mattress, white as a pig's belly and perspiring so heavily that the air was thick with his unwashed reek. Apart from a pair of sad, graying sleep shorts, his legs were bare. My sister crouched on all fours between them, her face pressed to his upper thigh. Hair fell about her slender back in damp, filthy clumps, and as I watched her spine jerk and spasm like a clay figure in a poorly done stop motion picture. I fell sideways against the door, my balance capsized. By bilious horror, what the hell is this? It's not what you think, Jonathan. My dad protested, weakly, though not even attempting to rise from the bed towards me. After what happened, it's the only way. I've been doing this for months. I tried to hide it. She asked me to. At first I said no, but I had to give in. I'm losing my mind. You've got to believe me. He pushed at Lydia ineffectually, unable to dislodge her from his leg even with all his strength. It was only when I said my sister's name that she looked up, her eyes drenched in the black of that afternoon, and I saw that her face wore a grin of blood, that her little feral hands were slick with it. A vein in my dad's thigh was open, seeping its contents, and a lazy stream upon the sheets. She's been eating, said my father, wearily. In her own way, she's been eating all along. It was a cold Sunday night, and the moon had just crept up from behind the clouds. Me and Hunter didn't have any plans. The hockey club social had devolved into a wine and cheese night, and being two very red-blooded second-year students, we wanted something a little bit more lively. That's how we ended up wandering the streets looking for a house party to crash. The town that we lived in was nearly entirely made up of students, so we had expected to find one rather easily. Exams were coming up, however. And to our displeasure, we had found that most houses were dark and quiet. This sucks balls, man. Hunter grimaced as he pondered the bleak expanse of shut doors and turned off fairy lights. We should just go to the student union. At least there's music. We may as well go home. I'd take a split and an early night over a school disco. I grunted and Hunter shrugged in response. What's that over there? Do I hear? Hell yeah, I do. Hunter ran ahead of me, slurring his words. In the distance, the faintest halo of a well-lit house could be seen, and a very dim, yet present, drum beat. That's a house party if ever I saw one. Fancy house too. Rich girls love to. Don't be crude. None of them will want you anyway. Look at the state of you. I laughed. Hunter was swaying, with the wind, and trying very hard to stay on the footpath. He had gone a little too hard at pre-drinks. Let's give it a bash. Better than nothing at this point. We headed towards the light, like moths to a flame. As we grew closer, the drum beat became more prominent. It wasn't like any music I'd ever heard before. It was almost like techno, except the drum beats felt more earthy. Usually at the front door of a house party there will be a little crowd of drunk girls pretending to smoke cigarettes. There was none of that here. The door to the house was slightly ajar, with flickering colorful LEDs bouncing off the interior wall. Let's just slip in. Hunter suggested, and pulled me behind him before I could protest. Something felt wrong, even then. And as I crossed the threshold into that fancy, bouncing, flat, I felt as though I was navigating some dangerous, uncharted territory. It looked like a house party, it even sounded like a house party to an extent. Crowds of people were swaying, and dancing to the odd drum beats. There were glasses of oozing green cocktails being passed around like STDs at an orgy. A strange thick smoke hung around the ceiling. A strange variety of weed perhaps. This is wet. Hunter whispered to me. He hijacked a glass of that strange green cocktail and downed it in one. His face scrunched up as though he'd just found a fly in the grass. Taste funky. Tequila maybe. The girls were pretty. Some of the prettiest girls I'd seen. They weren't dressed like students. There were no jeans 
and a nice t-shirt here. They were all garbed in silvery cocktail dresses and long flowing evening gowns. Each of them looked odd. There was something I couldn't put my finger on. It was like they were catalog models, posing carefully and unnaturally in ways that the photographer suggested were normal. Hunter vanished into the crowds and I gave up trying to keep track of him. I wanted to get out of the place and I figured the best way to do that would be to let him get more drunk, then carry him home to our trashy two bed on the edge of town. I found my own glass of bubbling green. It tasted like grass, but it burned my throat enough to tell me that it would get me drunk quick. This one has not met you yet. A girl approached me. She had fiery red hair and eyes that were two different colors. She was wearing a strange little gold piece with twisted mouth belts. Are you from Zirkin or Sofrate? Uh, neither. I replied, taken aback. They were foreign postgrads. Had to be. She looked at me with confusion, which told me I'd answered wrong. Zirkin, that explains why this one does not already have your acquaintance. I'm from Sofrate. Pleasure. She reached her elbow and bumped it into mine. Weird, but okay. You have really acclimatized well to the local dialect. That's easy to do. I made idle small talk. And Nate, you are. This one is Congelia. Interesting name you have. That's very southern. She took a long sip of her green drink. This one is a category one. You are. Category five. I replied. Postgrad speak. I just had to pretend to fit in. Congelia wasn't bad looking. If I played my cards right, I could pull before Hunter was passed out. Congelia looked impressed. Oh, I had no idea. This one is your humble servant. She reached out her thin, bony hand and tickled my chin as if it was the most normal thing in the world. This one did not want to come here, but the conglomerate decided that I was needed here. The climatization has been challenging to say the least. I could see that. A foreign girl dropped into some little town in England, her hand forced by her parents or whomever the conglomerate were, trying to find her way around all the odd dialects and temperamental locals. I can see it being hard. You just have to find your people, then it gets easier. A lot of like-minded people here. I took a cursory glance around the room at the odd crowds of stiff party goers. The men were all tall and fair, and the women all slender and pale. I play hockey. Do you have a sport? Oh, you have even picked up a local hobby. How very dedicated to assemblage you are. This one has not been so efficient, but I am partial to hula bola. She smiled. Do you like hula bola? We don't have that in Zirkin, I'm afraid. Care for another drink? I suggested. Oh, do not dishonor me so. As a category one, it is this one who should serve you the drink. Just wait two dialectoids, and this one shall retrieve you a beverage. She smiled unnaturally and squeezed my forearm. Her turn of phrase was odd to say the least. She clearly wasn't comfortable with the language yet. I hovered uncertainly at the edge of the room waiting for Congelia to return. It was then I spotted Hunter on the dance floor. He was doing something that only very slightly resembled break dancing. A few of the party goers were whispering suspiciously to each other as if dubious as to his invite. I was just about to grab him and hightail it out when Congelia returned. She batted her big eyelashes and I felt myself go weak at the knees. What's the worst that could happen? Hunter gets kicked out and stumbles home himself. I was fitting in. She thought I was a category five. Here is your drink. I put some bifula in. It adds a pleasant thrombosis. She explained courteously. You are most pleasing on the eye. This one would be honored to see you in your own skin. We are nearing copulating season. At least we would be back on sulfate. This one wonders if your biology cooperates. Oh, my biology always cooperates. I squinted my eyes, taking a long gulp of my new bubbling green drink. This one has had 43 successful clutches this season alone. I am deemed by the conglomerate as a promising breeding prospect, she said, as if it was the most seductive thing in the world. I spat out my drink. Time to get Hunter. Oh, please don't go. This one would be most unhappy if you were to leave. I was just starting to get my heat. She grabbed a roll of my fat from my belly and yanked me backwards. I felt my balls retreat back up into myself. I have to find my friend. He's drank a bit too much by Fula, if you know what I mean. I said to her, forcing a smile. It will only take a moment. She promised. I pondered for a moment. I had two options, both very compelling. One was to grab Hunter and run away from the crazy woman who claimed to be a breeding prospect. And the second 
arguably more natural choice was to have my way with her than grab Hunter and run away. I'm a weak, weak man and crazy as some of the best sex I'd had in my life. I can be quick. I said to her, she smiled, an upside down smile, then grabbed my nose and started pulling me up the stairs. I caught a glance at Hunter on the way, twirling and swirling around as two suited men glared. I had to be real quick. She only let me go when we were in an extremely neat and tidy bedroom. She shut the door behind us. Congelia paused in front of a mirror and began to rip off her earrings, tearing the skin as it went. She never flinched. Crazy girl. The locals use beds. This one wants to try it. She pointed at the maid bed. Didn't they use beds where she was from? Shut your eyes as this one disrobes. You shall be most pleasantly surprised by my mandible. The horny bastard that I was assumed a mandible was some part of the female anatomy. How tremendously wrong I was. I shut my eyes, apprehension tugging at my gut. There were squelching sounds and the sounds of wet folds falling to the ground. I gulped and thought of my ex, whom I realized in that moment I wasn't over yet. You can open, she said, and I did. I like to think there's a nice little alternate reality where I didn't open my eyes, or at least one where I did, and it was my ex standing there. I wasn't so lucky. I opened my eyes and felt blind terror overwhelm. Every one of my nerve endings stood where Congelia had been was a strange spindly mess of burnt red legs. There were four of them, and two similar appendages where arms should have been. She was. She was something like an ant, though tall and misshapen. Her antenna had glowing lights at their tips, and her eyes, all seven of them, were empty black voids of philosophical wondering. She moved, her hardened skin clinking and clanking as she clicked toward me, her strange pronged hands reaching out and ripping my shirt. She looked searchingly around my chest, as if expecting to find something there, and when she didn't, she recoiled. Her long spindles jolted and shook, and she stepped over the fleshy suit she had writhed out of and headed for the door with great urgency. Isabla, she shouted, Isabla. Her voice joined a frantic chant that was going on downstairs. A thousand voices joined with hers. Isabla, they shouted, Isabla. I scrambled to my feet, every inch of me shaking and trembling. I pushed past her, which she leapt on top of me. I snapped her arm in two. It made a loud crack and something wet, and Goopy slipped down on the floor. Isabla, she shouted, now pained. Everyone seemed so dumbfounded, and that is why I think I made it downstairs, without being accosted by one of the others. Hunter was still on the dance floor, but was curled up in a ball. There were two other ant things above him, poking and prodding at him like he was a lab experiment. I want my mom. He was crying. In the chaos of the moment, I somehow managed to grab him and get him out. So full of adrenaline I was, that I didn't feel the acid hit my back. Boy did I feel that later. They didn't follow us outside, and I somehow managed to run back home with Hunter draped over my shoulder. I tried calling the police, but they pissed themselves laughing and said I was the funniest student they'd had in years. My back was covered in burns from whatever acid they had spat at me as I fled. It was most superficial, but it had burned a hole through my best shirt. Hunter managed to fall asleep, and I was quite convinced that in the morning, he'd have no recollection of the night. I was prepared to file it away in horrifying things I pretend never happened, something that'd keep me up at night and that I'd drown in alcohol or drugs. I wasn't to be the case. I'm writing this here, not to share a story, but to warn you. I don't think I'm going to be around for much longer to raise the alarm bells that very clearly need to be rung. It started with Congelia, now back in her human form, though missing an arm. She stood at the front of my flat with a blank expression, just staring. Then where was another and another? There's about 50 as I write this here today. The police have been called again. They're on their way. I'm pretty sure they think I'm the victim of some elaborate prank. And I so very hope they're right. Because I can hear them heading up my stairs. 